Hey guys, it finally got officially announced. The Sony ZV-E10 is here. I have mine on order, so I will be doing detailed testing and deep dives on everything you need to know as soon as it ships to me in the next couple of weeks. But for now, I want to give you guys an overview of the most important features of the ZV-E10 and some initial thoughts on comparisons with things like the ZV-1 and Sony's other crop body cameras. So you can start to get an early idea of whether this is going to be a good choice for you. I will be referencing both the Sony ZV-1 and Sony A6400 a lot today because the ZV-E10 is in many ways a hybrid of those two cameras. So I recommend checking out my ZV-1 long-term summary and review and the ZV-1 versus A6400 comparison if you want more on what to expect from the ZV-E10. And speaking of related videos, you'll find those along with product links and timestamps for everything we are going to cover today down in the description. Lastly, before we get going, if you enjoy today's video, then like, subscribe, and let me know any thoughts or questions down in the comments. Next, we're going to talk about core features and design before I head out and give you some vlog examples which are going to show you the real world results you can expect with the ZV-E10. When it comes to design, the ZV-E10 strongly resembles some other Sony cameras, but more on that in the next section. There's an APS-C sensor and interchangeable lens design, fully articulating flip-out screen, and onboard three-capsule directional microphone. I'll show you what you can expect from those later. There's a new control layout compared to other Sony APS-C cameras on top with a sliding on-off switch, a selection of buttons, and a single dial. While we have the same buttons on the rear as the ZV-1, just in a slightly different layout. Not too extensive, but that selection of buttons should provide a reasonable scope for customizing the camera. There's also a zoom rocker near the shutter, which will operate power zoom lenses or clear image digital zoom, which is a nice feature for smoother video zooming. All of this is priced pretty competitively by Sony at £679 or $700 for the camera body only and 100 more to include the kit lens. The video frame rates which the ZV-E10 supports in 4K and 1080p are listed on screen right now. And one of the aforementioned buttons on top of the camera is set by default as a quick shortcut for 120 frames per second slow motion, which again sounds handy. Equally handy are the built-in ports, which include USB-C for charging, streaming or data transfer, 3.5mm microphone input and headphone output, plus micro HDMI for video output. And our last handy reference is for the hand grip itself, which looks pretty shallow and not the most ergonomic, but in exchange for that compromise, we get an even smaller body than the already svelte A6400. There's a dimensions comparison on screen now. At a weight of 343 grams, the ZV-E10 is 60 grams and 15% lighter than the A6400 and only 50 grams more than the ultralight ZV-1. For reference, 50 grams is around half what a deck of cards weighs. So not only is the ZV-E10 impressively light and compact, it's also much less likely to attract David Blaine or other card trick weirdos. Speaking of weirdos, let's go over to past day for some vlogging examples and discussion of the most important features of the ZV-E10. So, let's talk genetics. We know from this dumpster fire of a face that mine must be some kind of horrific travesty, but what about the ZV-E10? Well, from the ZV-1, we get the fully articulating flip-out screen, we get product showcase mode, and we get the gimmicky but maybe helpful for beginners bokeh button. From the A6400, we get almost everything else. So same sensor, 24 megapixels, which delivers 6K oversampled down into 4K for sharp 4K video. We get the same frame rate. So slow motion tops out at 120 frames per second rather than the ultra slow-mo. The ZV-1 can provide all the way up to 1000 frames per second. And we get the same autofocus coverage points, around 84% of the sensor, but apparently an updated AF system so that we get eye autofocus in video, which is pretty nice. There's also, as well as that kind of mother and father genetics, a weird incestuous uncle vibe with the A7C because that autofocus mode gives us some extra fine control around subject tracking sensitivity and speed of autofocus change which are nice additions, especially for getting cinematic results, but it does make the whole genetics question even more clouded. 
And the last but not least is the updated color science, which you'll find in the A7C and ZV-1. And apparently, I'll need to test this firsthand, the ZV-E10 as well. Now, one area where I have been quite disappointed in the early info on the ZV-E10 has been around stabilization. Like the ZV-1, it has digital stabilization through Active Steady Sharp, but while the ZV-1 crops in around 25%, so it's not great, but you can mitigate with things like the Ulanzi Wide Angle Lens, the ZV-E10 apparently looks to crop in around 45%, which is really substantial and potentially really limiting for the number of lenses you'd be able to use blogging. Now there are ways around this, it's super light by the sound of things and therefore a gimbal could be a really good option but it's an extra cost and it's an extra piece of gear and where I have my fingers crossed and I think could be a real advantage is with catalyst browse stabilisation. Gyro data captured by the camera as you shoot allows for awesome stabilisation in post-production. This is how catalyst browse stabilisation looks using the A7C and the crop lens that would work with the ZV-E10, the Sigma 16mm f1.4 info on both Catalyst and the lens linked in the description but long story short if you don't mind holding this somewhat heavy setup out at arm's length then when you crop in Catalyst can take an amazing image smooth it out and something like this could be a really nice combination. It's also been confirmed that like the ZV-1 the ZV-E10 is going to get almost the full complement of Sony picture profiles so you're getting all the S-Log, Cine and HLG variants which is great for high dynamic range situations like this but you won't be getting the real top end s cinetone that you get on things like the FX3. All in all still plenty of options to really have quote unquote pro level features and you know it's got HLG which is my personal favorite for colors so that's a win. The ZV-E10 has also inherited the product showcase or product review mode from the ZV-1 which is where the camera basically uses eye autofocus until you hold something up closer to the lens like this and it dynamically and cleverly shows off the product or in this case the nature that you're holding up and blurs out your face. Really nice addition and with some of the wide aperture lenses you'll be able to get for the ZV-E10 some really nice results possible. A definite win. Even more ZV-1 DNA, perhaps the dominant parent in this context, can be found in the audio of the ZV-E10, which we don't know it's identical yet, I'll need to get one and test it. Looks like the same design of three capsule directional microphone, even with the great little wind floof. You can hear the audio right now and indeed for all these other vlog sections and let me know how it sounds. Would you still want a mic? Would you vlog with something that sounds like this? I think it's definitely usable, even if it's not as good as a dedicated mic. Now, if I had to pick one single biggest selling point for the ZV-E10 compared to the ZV-1, it has to be the interchangeable lenses that the ZV-E10 can accommodate. You can change up your look almost infinitely with compatibility across all of Sony's E-mount line, even full frame lenses, though you'll only get the cropped field of view. Right now we are using one of my favourites which is the Sigma 30mm f1.4 if you love the bokeh you want to go catching bokeh mon. Also you've got great options that I've looked at before like the Sony 18-105 to f4G lens. That is a power zoom lens so you'll be able to take advantage of the zoom rocket in the design of the ZV-E10 if you aren't already sick of zoom after 2020. Overall, thanks to those interchangeable lenses, you'll be able to achieve more looks than a Derek Zoolander fashion montage. Another area to watch out for with the ZV-E10 is low light. Now, the larger APS-C sensor should give it a significant advantage over the ZV-1 and it really should destroy most smartphones. But having used the A6400, which has basically the same insides, I do have some concerns. You see, with that camera, which is what we're using right now, the low light footage can be a bit like my abs during the pandemic. Sometimes decent, respectable, but at other times ill-defined, mushy and really unattractive looking. So what do you think from this test? We're at ISO 3200, 1 over 50 shutter using an f1.4 lens wide open. Are these results acceptable? Let me know in the comments. Now, one concern I do have, if the ZV-E10 uses the exact same sensor as Sony's current crop body cameras, like the A66 and 6400, is rolling shutter. Allow me to demonstrate. You see my face? It's not great. It has its share of problems, but one thing it is not is made out of jelly. Now observe.
That right there is rolling shutter. Before we draw to a close, let's touch on the few remaining features of the ZV-E10, which we didn't yet cover. You get the soft skin effect, which was first included with the ZV-1, and that can help you achieve results like this. Hey there, I'm Captain Snapchat, as smooth as a Hollywood wax. Why you would want results like that is a different question. Now, we already touched on the ability to live stream using USB-C, but that's very nice. And while this channel is all about videography, I should point out you're also getting a very capable photo camera, very much like the A6400, including continuous shooting up to 11 shots per second, but with no viewfinder on the ZV-E10. No doubt I will have forgotten some feature, so let me know if that's the case in the comments and I'll provide thoughts there. But for now, let's talk conclusions. When the ZV-E10 was first announced and I watched that initial video, I was really excited. However, seeing the level of image crop you get with active stabilization was a bigger kick in the crotch than when I found out Arnold Schwarzenegger did not want to be my best friend. Plus, the use of a sensor with significant rolling shutter issues was another blow, albeit a less severe one, but I still feel optimistic. There are a lot of nice design choices, especially for videography, and thanks to that fairly aggressive pricing, I can basically switch to a ZV-E10 from the A6400 at zero cost or maybe even a small profit depending on used A6400 pricing. The fully articulating flip screen, zoom rocker, catalyst stabilization, improved audio options and lighter weight all make the ZV-E10 a no-brainer upgrade for my crop body camera as a video shooter provided the real-world comparison with the A6400 plays out the way that I expect it to when the ZV-E10 arrives. So stay tuned for that upcoming comparison. Let me know any questions, thoughts, or ideas for ZV-E10 content you'd like to see me create down in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, then like, subscribe, and most importantly, until next time, take it easy. Another advantage you should be getting with the ZV-E10. <coughs> Another advantage. <coughs> Another. <coughs> well, that went well. <coughs> Smooth. Rolling shutter, yeah, yeah, yeah.